we're going to look at the end of uh, you know, chapter three, and, and we're going to be going into uh, maybe four and five. We'll see. Uh, depends on what the Lord does with this. I'm going to read you the verses for us. So I'm in Revelation chapter three, uh, starting with number four, verse one, the letter to Sardis. Jesus says, to the angel of the church in Cyrus, right, the one who has the, has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, each time that Jesus starts to talk to these churches, he gives them different things about himself that describe him. So by the time that you go through these several churches, you will find a full uh, explanation of who he is. So he says he is the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now earlier we saw that the seven spirits of God, this Holy Spirit, was in the throne room of Father. Father God, Adam. And, and now Jesus has this. And he says, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. But if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come against you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the victor, the overcomer, will be dressed in white clothes. And I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. And he always closes with, anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, uh, white clothes represent purity. And I've talked to you about the book of life before. Your names are in it. <clears throat> and he's saying, if you overcome, if you stand with him, at the end, no matter how difficult it becomes, as we're standing before Father God, Jesus will acknowledge our name before the Father and before all the angels. Now, let's share a couple of things about Sardis. What tends to happen when we look at this is, you know, <coughs> we think that uh, that we're the smartest people in the world because we're currently alive and fortunate enough to live in, in a good country like America. And, uh, and we think that all the old civilizations, they, they weren't civilized, you know, they weren't a civilization. And yet, A lot of these towns go back 6,000 years, and there are places where they go before that. And they had a lot of similar things that we have today. They did it in a different form. And of course, the wealthy lived well, and the poor not so well. There's not a lot of differences, because people are people are people. And so, and so when you get people that are willing to help other people, things get better. And when you get people that don't want to help other people, or worse yet, want to advantage, uh, take advantage of other people, uh, then it gets worse. Uh, so, uh, Sardis is a city located in West Asia Minor, which is Turkey today, about 50 miles east of Smyrna and 30 miles southeast of Thyatira. Uh, Thyatira. Doing good today. And uh, there were two letters we had read. It was an important wealthy city located on a commercial trade route running east and west through the kingdom of Lydia, of which Sardis was the capital. It was also the place where gold and silver coins were struck. Much of Sardis' wealth came from its textile manufacturing and dye industry and its jewelry trade. Most of the city practiced pagan worship. Pagan worship is um, basically orgies, uh, gluttony and uh, uh, and sacrificing children. 
Yeah. Most of the city practiced pagan worship, and there were many mystery cults or secret religious societies. You see them around today. They're still here. Sometimes when you read a, remember I some of the old magazines, uh, the True and Men's Life, oh, there's some old magazines, and, and you'll see them today where, where we have a secret no one has, and they'll and, you know, contact us and we'll give you more information. And uh, the secret is you just wasted your money. <laughs> the magnificent Temple of Artemis, which is a famous <laughs> temple, uh, dating from the fourth century BC, was one of its points of interest and still exists as an important ruin. The remains of a Christian church building, which have been discovered immediately adjacent to the temple, testify a post apostolic Christian witness to this evil pagan city noted for its loose living. Can you imagine if we were literally attached to a pagan temple, a temple of Satan? That would be, uh, that would be something. Uh, so to the, to the church to which the letter was addressed, continued exist, its existence until the 14th century, but it was never prominent. And today the city of Sark exists amid the ancient ruins. Now, you're going to see as we've gone along already, go along, that most of these places get destroyed or minimized in the 14th century. And that's because that's when the Muslims came in. That's when the Muslims, uh, uh, the Persians, the Turks tried to overtake the world. They wanted all the world as a caliphate. And so they came in, and uh, it was a time when Rome had gotten strong, but the uh, Byzantine church in that area had gotten weak. And so the Muslims were willing to, uh, were able to overrun. So uh, you'll see in the 14th century, where they came in, sometimes they just killed all the Christians. Sometimes they sent a bunch of them away. Sometimes they did what they do with the Jews a lot of times is, we're gonna let you stay alive. You're gonna be able to live here and you're gonna be able to buy goods. But here's the thing, you're gonna pay us a really hefty tax. And by the way, for those of you like the Jewish, for instance, would always would let their beards grow, right? And so one of the insults that they had was that any time a Jewish man, no matter how old he was, would be walking down the street and a little Muslim kid would come up and he'd say, you know, bend over. And he would have, the man would have to bend over. The kid would take his beard and yank it several times. And the Jewish man had to laugh and say, oh, well done, little boy, well done. So much for free where we live, right? <laughs> so basically, the church had lost its witness. That's what the Lord is getting at, is they were, they were kind of overcome by all this stuff. Now, one of the things that you want to understand is uh, Jesus Christ is introduced to the church at Sardis uh, as the possessor of the sevenfold spirit of God and that ensures his righteous judgment of the wicked. Christ also has the star, or the messenger of this church, in his possession. As a matter of fact, around the time of the early church, a lot of people thought that when they saw the stars, that, uh, that the angels, that were places where angels were living. Uh, but at any rate, so that Christ also has the star, or the messenger of the church, in his possession making the message being delivered all the more authoritative. That's why I try to sweat it out every week and understand what am I supposed to show with, to you? Because I'm going to have to stand before Jesus. The same description of Christ as holding the seven stars in his right hand was given in the letter to the church at Ephesus 2.1 to make clear that the leaders of the church are responsible to no human representative of Christ but must give account directly to the Lord himself. And Jesus can judge his church righteously because nothing is hidden from his omniscient gaze. Now, omniscient, God, Lord Jesus, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Uh, omniscient, they are all-knowing, all-seeing. Uh, om omnipresent, God can be everywhere at once. Jesus can be everywhere at once. And omnipotent, all-powerful. The horns, potency, strength. So while we human beings are limited in what we can see, 
Christ sees our heart. And so you can say to this church, you had the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. It was considered to be a spiritual church and one that had an effective ministry and testimony for God, but from the divine standpoint, it was dead as far as spiritual life and power were concerned. You see, sometimes the churches get so caught up in, in special events and, and, and outside, you know, doing all these outside the uh, helps to the community. And so it might make it might make the people in the church feel good and think that they're serving the Lord, but the Lord might want them to be doing something very different. Now, certainly there are times that he wants us to do those things, but what happens is a church will get self-satisfied, and you start, you, you start to not listen to Jesus or don't listen to him closely or misunderstand what he's saying because you're not paying attention and studying and reading your Bible and praying. Pastor, this is this is section is uh, part of the section that's all written by uh, uh, Doctor uh, Walworth, uh, and uh, he says the searching judgment of Christ also speaks to the modern church, which often is full of activity, even though there is little that speaks of Christ in spiritual life and power. And Barclay, who was a famous pastor uh, from the British Isles, uh, observes that a church is in danger of death when it begins to worship its own past when it is more concerned with forms than with life, when it loves systems more than it loves Jesus Christ, when it is more concerned with material than spiritual things. The white garments, I'll just say more about that and we'll move on to the next church. He says, the one who overcomes and conquers is victorious, will be clothed, in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To those individuals in the Sardis church who conquered by remaining true to Christ, the promise is given that they will be clothed in white garments. Now they were worn in the ancient world at weddings and other festive occasions. You might remember a story, in a lot of Jesus' stories, uh, people go, read much anymore and it really should uh, there is a wedding guest there is a wedding throne and man and now God is the one who is throwing the wedding okay and he tells his angels his helpers to go out and invite me as a list of people and they're the, the more spiritual prominent people Now those weddings go on, like the funerals, they go on for seven days, sometimes longer. And uh, it was an expensive thing to do. Although our society has been getting pretty good at paying, spending a lot of money on weddings too. So when it comes time for the wedding, all the people invited have excuses. Oh, can't make it, got to send a sick on, got to go buy a cow, got to whatever. None of them are coming. The man from the wedding is angry because he says, go out into the streets and bring anyone. Bring the poor, bring the lame, bring the broken people in. Because the people who are supposed to be spiritual won't listen to me. And they won't come to me. They won't respond. So they bring all these people in. Now, they had, if you accepted coming to the wedding, and in this case, there were a lot of poor people coming, and they were in for, this is like a big deal for them, they probably remember this all their life, and, and they would give them white wedding clothes if they didn't have any. But in this story, one of the people does not have a white robe. <laughs> and the head of the wedding, again, this is God, says, you, why, where is your white robe? Dry cleaner though, he didn't have it. He didn't accept one. And so they, the Lord says, throw him out into the dark, into, for, to the tormentors. He said, talk about hell. See, a lot of our world just says, there, well, there's no evil. That's just, 
you know, and there's no, there's no God. There's God takes offense at that. So when you read that story and others like it, what you realize is he didn't accept the white robe. He didn't accept Jesus. So you don't get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is going to be something we're all going to be at, unless you accept Jesus. As I told you, white also represents uh, the purity of God's people as they're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And those who share the marriage supper of the Lamb, the victorious Jesus Christ, the overcomer, are seen in white robe. Now we go to Philadelphia. Here's a good church. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the Holy One, the True One, this is Jesus identifying himself, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and closes and no one opens, says, I know your works, because you have limited strength, but you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Look, I have placed before you an open door, that no one is able to close. They're heaven down. Take note, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. Note this, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my coming into the door, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. That's the tribulation. I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown, the victor. I will make you a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, and you will never go out again. I will write your, on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my name. Three new names. What he's saying is, I mentioned this, I think, a little bit last week, is at, at the end, at the end, the earth is purified by, by fire, whether it's literal fire or whether it's the fire of the Lord, the earth is purified. The new Jerusalem comes down. And it's very large. It's about half the size of America. But the rest of the world is still there. And there are still people there. There are people that make it through the tribulation. And so he's saying that you will be in the holy city forever. Of all the world, that will be the best place to be. The city of Philadelphia, known in modern times as Alessiar, is located in Lydia, some 28 miles southeast of Sardis, and was named after a king of Pergamum. All these churches are in a rough circle, and John, John was the pastor. Uh, and when he wasn't there, uh, from what I've been able to read, Timothy takes over. Now, uh, Atlas Philadelphia, who built the city, the word Philadelphia means brotherly love, is found six other times in the New Testament. Here, the word occurs for the seventh and final time, but only here is it used of a city bearing this name. Philadelphia had a long history, and several times was almost completely destroyed by earthquakes. The most recent big rebuilding was in AD 17. Do any of you watch Drive Through History? Drive Through History, Drive Through the Gospels, right now, Drive Through Acts. It's a great show. It's on, uh, I know it's on a lot of Christian channels, uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure you can get it on your computers. And, and, and uh, uh, David Stott does this, and, uh, and his family have been pastors for a long time, and he's a neat guy. You, I mean, you just, you know, he, he, he keeps it light when he can keep it light, but you see all these places as they are today, and then a lot of times he'll have computer mock-ups or whatever to show you what the city like that, and he meets the people and he talks to them and, and it's just amazing when you realize it. This isn't, I mean, it's a story, but it's a real story. And it's still going on. This story has not stopped. Grapes were one of the principal crops. And in keeping with this, uh, Dionysus was one of the chief 
objects of pagan worship use the wine god. Through the centuries, a nominal Christian testimony continued in the city of Philadelphia and prospered even under Turkish rule. And Turkish rule came in 1400 into that whole area, all the Middle East and, and uh, all of Turkey, and then they got up further for a while in Spain, and then they got thrown back. Um, and that remained as the caliphate until 1918, when they decided to, uh, in the First World War, decide with the Germans. So it was a bad, bad decision. And uh, so the British were given that area to take, be in charge of, so they, they broke up the caliphate. And so that's what starts the whole process of bringing a holy land back to the now, the message addressed to the Church of Philadelphia has the unusual characteristic of being almost entirely one of praise, similar to that received by the Church of Smyrna, but in sharp contrast to the messages to Sardis and Laodicea. Christ has the keys of David. He has the keys of death and hell. story that explains that is found in Isaiah 22, 22. Christ has the key to truth and holiness and eternal life, as well as the opportunity, service, and testimony. The Philadelphia church, also surrounded by paganism and wickedness, needed the assurance Christ gives that he has the power to bring about his sovereign will. So they stand for the Lord regardless. to the synagogue of Satan is to unbelieving Jews who are opposing the witness of the gospel of Philadelphia and making it difficult for the Christians to bear a good testimony before the pagan land. See, Satan made it hard then for people to have a good witness for Christ. And so he messed with the churches. He never stopped. He's still doing that today. People oppose us today the same way. Uh, many people just can't handle obeying Jesus' commands. You know, it's love. It's love and kindness and forgiveness. Well, everybody says that's wonderful until they have to do it. And then it becomes hard. Dr. Walworth says the church will always encounter satanic opposition when it attempts to faithfully declare the gospel and stand for Christ. <clears throat> that's what's going on today in a lot of the churches and you see a lot of the churches have stopped preaching the word showing the cross talking about sacrifice and victory that Jesus has at the cross so Philadelphia will not go through those people will not go through any type of wrath of God one of the commentators wrote that what purpose of the tribulation is to bring retribution to the world to punish sin? This pouring out of God's wrath is not the future of the Bible promises to the church. For Paul says believers are not destined for wrath. Remember that when we studied 1 Thessalonians. Now the Lord's coming is compared to an imminent event, one that will suddenly happen without announcement. We see that throughout the Bible. And then people say, well, he's not here yet. In view of this expectation, the church at Philadelphia is urged to hold fast to their testimony for Christ in order to receive the reward at his coming. The expression soon is to be understood as something that is sudden and unexpected, but not necessarily immediate. So when